I find myself somewhat submerged by these compliments, not to mention the uh, humanitini, <laughs> uh, which uh, was, I think, a not at all ambivalent but insinuous way of uh, getting me to shut up. I react normally rather badly to alcohol. But I'm particularly delighted by uh, one thing that Homie said, uh, which is that he placed me at uh, the crossroads of the humanities and the social sciences. If I may uh, indulge in a confidence, I have temporarily had it with the social sciences, <laughs> uh, especially given the directions in which uh, they tend to be going. And partly to get a little bit more serious because of the events uh, of this summer. Uh, the war in Lebanon was for me one war too many. And uh, I find it very hard to contemplate the future of international relations uh, with any particular uh, hope, optimism, or, or a glimpse of improvement. Uh, so uh, it's wonderful to be adopted by the humanities especially since uh, in about uh, two months' time, I'm going to teach in French a course on Camus, who has been my hero since 1945. And I'm uh, beginning to plunge into his work. And my goodness, after the prose of much of social science these days, <laughs> what, are they, what, what a wonderful. Uh, uh, what a wonderful change. So I'm delighted, but uh, uh, Camus himself spent half of his complete works, which are now being published in four enormous volumes of the Pléiade, uh, on uh, actuality, on current affairs. And uh, uh, his uh, 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 teaching that uh, the writer, the artist, and I'm not an artist, uh, but still, uh, cannot be detached from what happens in, uh, around him and cannot act as if art for art's sakes uh, was the only thing he should be uh, worried about is uh, a message that uh, uh, I'm still very uh, fond of and loyal to. I'm going to be brief. Uh, you all, I imagine, assume to have read my immortal prose. Uh, and therefore, I'm not going to repeat it. And one good reason why I don't want to repeat it is that I have a sense of having repeated myself since about 1963. <laughs> uh, the first article I wrote about American foreign policy in a journal which miraculously is still alive, uh, Daedalus, uh, was, uh, this was in 1963. Uh, and I have... Uh, uh, then uh, devoted a whole book uh, called Gulliver's Troubles uh, to American foreign policy in 1968. Uh, then there was a, a primacy of world order 10 years later. I uh, have uh, dealt with American foreign policy in five collections of essays. And since it's, on n'est jamais si bien servi que par soi-même, one helps oneself best. May I mention to you that my last collection just came out and has the cheerful title of Chaos and Violence, <laughs> uh, 20 articles about the sad fate of the world. And there was a book which nobody has read, but uh, which was about the uh, uh, Iraq war called Gu uh, Gulliver Unbound in 2004. Now, the article that uh, uh, is now actually in Chaos and Violence and which was uh, about uh, American foreign policy, was uh, largely written uh, in reaction against uh, the neoconservative wave uh, which uh, submerged America since 2001, and which is not, in my opinion, so much neoconservative as neo-imperialist and a reaction also against the contribution to this uh, uh, wave by s several ex-liberals and by the caving in 
of many other liberals. My friend Tony Smith, who's uh, here somewhere, uh, I don't see he's hiding here somewhere because Tony doesn't hide. Hi, Tony. Uh, is coming out uh, with a book which is undoubtedly going to produce, uh, oh, you know, the kind of gentle noises which the article by Steve Walt, who is here, and uh, uh, Mirsheimer did recently. But uh, so it was a reaction against uh, the sort of intellectual disaster uh, which uh, we face in the study of uh, um, thought about American foreign policy. And uh, it's uh, uh, a reaction against events, against ideas, against hubris, whose catastrophic effects are, have been visible, in my opinion, practically everywhere. And uh, to be quick, my descent from uh, what has been America's course uh, in, uh, since the coming to power of uh, George W. Bush is a descent on, on three fronts, uh, realities, uh, priorities, and style. On the realities, uh, uh, let me call another one of my hero, as you can see, it's not just dualities, but my heroes don't always go together. Having just mentioned Camus, I now have to mention de Gaulle, uh, of whom Camus was not very fond and vice versa. But that's France, of course. Nobody is ever any fond of anybody else. <laughs> and fortunately, there is a tradition of tolerance in France without which there would be no Frenchmen left. Uh, if uh, French people of different opinions weren't able to dine uh, in the evening together uh, without talking about what really divides them, uh, the country would be, well, would have been occupied by others uh, for a very long time. And it was the goal who said that there is no politics uh, apart from reality. Uh, the uh, realities which I think uh, have been neglected uh, were had to do with the illusion of superpowerhood. When superpowerhood consists primarily of the use of force, intimidation, and unilateralism, it just won't work. And there are some very good reasons for this. It's, after all, a famous military man, also known as Napoleon and he knew what he was talking about, who said that you can do anything you like with bayonets except sit on them. Uh, and this administration has literally been sitting on them, partly because it hasn't had enough bayonets to plant into others, uh, as we can see every day uh, in Iraq. Uh, what uh, the reality which has been ignored and which I tried briefly to deal with in this article was that there are very different kinds of power. Uh, that military power and the ingredients of military power, which this country uh, produces in uh, uh, ex excess, uh, that there are different kinds of power uh, which uh, uh, are shared with a number of other countries. Uh, the, the soft power that uh, my friend Joe Nye always writes about uh, what I called in that article building power, which is not the same thing entirely as economic power, but which is uh, the art of helping others uh, build their institutions, which is a very important one in this kind of world. There are other kinds of power in which the United States not only is not always dominant, but in uh, which the United States is sometimes are uh, quite deficient. And uh, these other kinds of power are very often uh, not terribly uh, usable. I mean, military power, I mean, is sometimes not very usable and not always very effective. And yet, I think we have acted as if it was the alpha and omega of international politics. What is true is that military superiority is indeed uh, a great American privilege on paper, but we have seen that much of it is really not usable for all kinds of reasons. 
And uh, we have seen that uh, America certainly, because of its general might uh, and its interests spread all over the world, does have an important leadership role when the United States doesn't act. It's hard often for the others to act, if only because the United States is very good at not wanting others to act, as we've seen in the Middle East. But uh, this administration has played uh, this leadership role extremely badly. Then after the realities which uh, have been neglected, there are priorities uh, which have been also ignored. These uh, priorities depend, of course, in large part on the realities. And among those which have been uh, ignored or neglected, uh, in, any, no, in no particular order, there is uh, the problem of global warming. And for those who uh, have not seen it, even if uh, people are not necessarily in love with Al Gore, uh, I think that his movie performs a very important service and makes me rather sorry that he's not uh, in, in politics these days. Uh, it's an, uh, a phenomenon which is, uh, creates an enormous risk for everybody's welfare. Uh, there is the depletion of very important resources, not, all, not only oil, uh, and the competition for those resources creates an enormous risk for peace, and that might get worse and worse. There is uh, the incipient, quote unquote, uh, clash of civilizations. Uh, everybody denies that uh, there is one, but it's very clear that there could be one if one isn't very careful about it. And this too is an enormous risk, not only for peace uh, among nations, but also for the internal stability of countries, more and more of them, in which there are important uh, Muslim minorities amidst populations uh, which sometimes uh, treat uh, these minorities rather badly or with profound suspicion. Uh, there are all the non-proliferation issues which um, increase the volatility of the international system and are very, very, uh, very, very hard to, uh, to settle. And uh, last uh, in this list, but not least, the enormous problem of failing states. Uh, the state is supposed to be the... Uh, uh, the unit of international relations, just as money is our uh, unity uh, for, for daily life. But uh, half of uh, a good uh, half of the states are states by name only, are in uh, different degrees of decomposition and decrepitude. And the problem with uh, failed states uh, is that they have a tendency to turn murderous. Uh, and particularly on their own citizens. And we have seen this throughout the 90s uh, and uh, this particular decade. And the greatest danger for the world, of course, is when all those uh, neglected uh, priorities are interconnected, as they are in the Middle East and in Africa uh, in particular, and to some extent in Eastern Asia. Among the priorities, in addition to neglected issues which are interconnected, there are some values. And uh, foreign policy, like all policy, uh, is a mix of coping with uh, realities and trying to preserve and promote one's own values. And uh, the three which I think are very important values for the United States and its friends and allies, uh, first of all, peace, obviously. Uh, it's very hard to stop conflicts once they start. Uh, the risks of uh, uh, a conflict beginning and turning uh, in a completely unexpected uh, direction or ending, uh, as to some extent uh, the one in Lebanon did this summer, with results which were exactly the opposite of what the people who started it had hoped are very, very great. So peace is a very important value. And when uh, one's uh, own actions, even if they are 
intended to restore or preserve in the long run peace if they violate it in the short run uh, take a very, very large, uh, it's a very large gamble. The second one, of course, is development. It is in nobody's interest to have uh, a world in which uh, the number of both people and countries uh, who are below the line of poverty uh, continues to be as important as it is. And while experts uh, quite, uh, for very good reasons, quarrel about the right form of development, nevertheless, it is uh, a, a concern that everybody should have. And finally, uh, not, I would say, as a third value, I don't call it the direct promotion of democracy, because it seems to me uh, that democracy has to come from the inside. Uh, it certainly does not concern. Uh, consists exclusively of free elections, but it does have to come from inside a country. It's very hard to bring from the outside, uh, but the pressure from the outside in a world which cannot simply leap from one day or even a, a decade to the next uh, from authoritarianism, uh, brutality, totalitarianism, chaos, I'm thinking about a place like Somalia these days, uh, into democracy, uh, the, what can be asked for is uh, the protection of basic human rights, uh, which can be demanded of uh, very different sorts of regimes, uh, and uh, which would already be a beginning, if only in order to protect the inhabitants of countries, even when they are not entirely free uh, to choose the government, uh, their newspapers, uh, their style of life, and so on. And finally, uh, uh, I, I do dissent, and that's what the article was very much about, uh, from the style of foreign policy, uh, which this administration since 2001 uh, has uh, uh, performed, to speak. Uh, I think that uh, uh, sort of uh, passion for, almost drunkenness with unilateralism has been a disaster because what the world needs uh, is exactly the opposite. And one of the things it needs most, and which by definition is the opposite of unilateralism, is a reinforcement of uh, the various networks of international organizations, public and private, uh, which are probably for this day and age uh, the closest one can come to an embryonic and messy kind of world government, but which one needs. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, that means at least uh, uh, two things. One is the reinforcement of existing international organizations so that uh, they are themselves uh, made more accountable uh, and more democratic. Uh, and there have been various proposals made in this direction, uh, both by, uh, by two people whose uh, names normally one does not associate. Uh, one is uh, my old friend uh, Bob Cohane in recent writings, and the other one is the current French Prime Minister, de Villepin. Uh, so there is this problem of making international organizations more accountable and less uh, hierarchical and bureaucratic in order to reinforce their authority. And the other thing is to provide them with the kinds of international forces that somebody like uh, Sir Brian Urquhart suggested already about 10 years ago, and which in crisis points uh, would be extremely important to have on hand, because waiting until the states voluntarily uh, contribute to those forces uh, is uh, a very, long and often uh, unsuccessful business. Uh, the second, uh, uh, next to this repudiation of unilateralism, is a, a, repudi a repudiation of the extraordinary degree of militarization of American foreign policy. Uh, there was uh, a justification for it, uh, perhaps, although I never thought it was entirely uh, uh, justified during the days of the Cold War. But the Cold War is gone. And I think that for the United States to have 
the military budget, uh, which is as large as that of the rest of the world combined, uh, is both a political uh, and a moral disaster. Think of what could be done with that money, with half of that money, uh, both for development, uh, for the uh, creation of, of peace forces, uh, for all kinds of things at home which are neglected. And I think this uh, degree of uh, uh, pride in, in military power uh, has to be fought, if only to uh, in decrease the danger of its use and to redirect resources the way they should be. And finally, uh, in that style, having repudiated unilateralism and militarization, what is absolutely essential and what this administration has been particularly bad at is uh, the search for consensus. Uh, nothing can be done in this kind of a world by fear. This is not a world in which, it's not the world of the Congress of Vienna. Uh, it's a world in which if you want to accomplish almost anything, uh, it can only be done at best by a combination of pressures and search for compromise and for consensus. And uh, we can see this in many of the issues of uh, mentioned, in particular the issues of, of proliferation. In other words, it's a world which desperately needs uh, not cluster bombs or more types of nuclear weapons, but more, uh, more diplomacy, a world this administration hasn't liked very much. Uh, without diplomacy, nothing can be achieved. With diplomacy, it's not sure that everything can be achieved, but what is very clear is that without it, it won't. Um, I'll give you two examples, but I'm sure we'll come back to this in the discussion. One has been uh, the handling of, uh, that's going to not please every, everybody, but such is life, uh, the handling of uh, uh, Hamas after the uh, Palestinian elections. And the other one has been uh, uh, the handling of Iran. And the handling of Iran, and we are now told, I gather by, is it the CIA mm -hmm. I heard on the radio today? That they are not anymore so sure that the uh, Iranians are really uh, aiming uh, on building nuclear weapons. Well, good. But it seems to me that one does not negotiate with a country which is a serious country and uh, has gone through all kinds of ups and downs in recent history by telling them uh, we want to negotiate with you so that you stop your nuclear program and as a, pre as a prelude, stop it. That's a conception of negotiation which is worthy of a play of UNESCO uh, <laughs> and worthy of this particular administration. But uh, as the French would say, it ain't serious. I mean, just put yourself at the receiving end. And I think it's this incapacity of American diplomacy at times, either to put itself at the receiving end, or to remember, as I said in a book, uh, more than, uh, well, let's not count the years, uh, the impossibility of understanding the foreignness of foreigners, which has been the cause of our disasters are in Vietnam and in Iraq. Uh, so uh, this search for consensus requires a re-evaluation of diplomacy and above all, because this matters in the world as it is, which is a world of uh, media and echoes, it requires uh, a very different tone. Um, I think there have been far worse people uh, in the administration in recent years uh, one disappeared suddenly the, uh, last week, but uh, far worse people than Condoleezza Rice. However, the tone of Condoleezza Rice is one which uh, makes my teeth uh, grind uh, furiously. It's uh, haranguing, reprimanding, condemning. We will not tolerate. We will not allow. Uh, we will not accept. This is not the tone of diplomacy. And since a great power is almost by definition 
always suspected of the worst, it takes a, lot, a certain amount of effort to show to others that one's intentions are not quite as bad uh, as uh, what others may believe. And we have neglected all that side of, uh, of foreign affairs, and that's one of the reasons why in my article I was so enthusiastic about the book of uh, Brady Kiesling, uh, the foreign service officer who resigned in protest against the war in Iraq in early 19, in 2003. The book is called Diplomacy Lessons, which is a wonderful treatise on how to handle foreigners, which is what diplomacy is supposedly about. So I've been, as usual, too long. The article is even longer. And uh, it's high time for, for me to answer questions, I suppose. <laughs> or not answer questions, as the case may be.